so a pharyngeal pouch is a little bit like a hernia in your throat. And uh, it occurs right at the top of the esophagus. The esophagus being the food pipe. Uh, and around the food pipe are particular muscles. We call them superior middle constrictors, which wrap around the top of the food pipe uh, in a circumferential way. And in between those muscles, those two top muscles, as one gets older, sometimes there's a little weakness that can occur, a bit like the hernias that we all know about in the groin. And in between that weakness, the mucosa or the lining can get pushed out between the two muscles, causing this pouch, uh, which people know as a pharyngeal pouch. So most people complain of a slight difficulty swallowing. Sometimes people complain of gurgling, particularly when lying flat. Some people note regurgitation, so food coming back up that's just gone down but then comes back up, uh, but not vomiting as such. And occasionally people also complain of bad breath. When the pharyngeal pouch is quite big and is sometimes uh, causing what's called aspiration, so where the food content goes down the windpipe and can cause recurrent chest infections, which can be really problematic. So there's a whole plethora of ways that it can present, but typically the number one, I would say, is difficulty swallowing. And the key point to make there is that when you have a difficulty swallowing, the first thing to rule out isn't a pharyngeal pouch. The first thing to rule out is that there's nothing something more sinister causing that food not going down. So that's the key point here. You need to go and see your doctor if food is genuinely getting stuck going down because it's very likely you'll need, you'll need to have a look down to ensure there's no cancer there. And then from then on, we can move on towards diagnosis, which include pharyngeal pouch. So you'd think that if you have a big pouch in your, in your, coming off your throat, that if you pass a telescope down, you'd easily see it. That's actually not the case. It's pretty much impossible with just a normal nasendoscope to see a pouch. Uh, and even with an OGD, so stomach scope, it's pretty much impossible to see it as you just pass straight past it. So the primary modality to look at a pouch or diagnose a pouch is something called a barium swallow. Now, barium swallows have a very limited value for most things, but they are very good at picking up a pouch. And you'll see, so barium swallows where you swallow contrast on x-ray video, and the pouch, will, the contrast will obviously seep into the pouch and show this herniation coming off the food pipe. Um, yeah, that's, the, that's the, the primary way of identifying it. Well, of course, we grade how big the pouch is based on how big it is on the, on the contrast swallow. The pouches, of course, you, you potentially, the, the symptom complex is the most important thing. So once we're happy, we've got the diagnosis, we're happy, nothing malignant's going on, we have to decide whether we need to intervene. If the symptoms aren't too bad, it may be that we watch and wait and do nothing. Um, if the symptoms are troublesome, then medicines won't help. Surgery is the only way to go. And paradoxically, the smaller the pouch is, the, the more difficult treatment is, funnily enough. And the reason for that is, is to visualize the pouch and the bar that goes between the two, we have to pass a diverticular scope. So in effect, it's like a duck-billed speculum that goes into the mouth whilst you're asleep. One side of the speculum, so open, a bit like a duck bill, goes into the food pipe, and the other part sits in the hernia, in the pouch. And then in between, we see this bar of mucosa. And that bar is what needs to be split. There are lots of different ways of doing it, and from a sort of layperson's point of view, it doesn't really make a difference. Uh, we often use the traditional way nowadays is to use a staple gum, but more and more we're using different devices like the endoseal or laser. Um, and uh, we can do those pouches so long as it's big enough to get the duckbill speculum through it. Sometimes the pouches are either so small or too big to do that, and then we need to do an external approach. So in that operation, uh, it's a general anesthetic, again, it's a much bigger operation. We stuff the inside of the pouch via the mouth with some ribbon gauze, and then we approach 
do an incision, an incision on the inside, outside the neck. We come down to the pouch, and then we either excise the pouch or invert it and make sure that the the, the potential hole is sealed off. Um, so that's a much bigger operation and not first line. The vast majority can be done endoscopically. Yeah, so uh, when I counsel patients about any sort of surgery, you've got to weigh up the pros and cons. And it's the vast majority of patients with pharyngeal pouches are older, often older men, often almost always over the age of 65. And we have to weigh up the pros and cons of it. Now, clearly, if you've got somebody that's not very well, and he's got very mild discomfort when he when he swallows because of a pouch. You're probably going to think that the the, the benefits aren't going to outweigh the risks. Um, and sometimes you have patients that are pretty unwell but are aspirating with a pharyngeal pouch, and we've got to you know the genuine benefit from doing the pouch is worth the risk, even though the risk is quite high. And uh, you might ask, well, what the risks are? The primary risk of a pharyngeal pouch operation of any kind is making a hole and leaking. So, of course, we need to contain all the food and saliva inside the food pipe. And if there's a breach, that can be very concerning. And the main uh, reason why we're very cautious about pouches is to avoid this sort of hole. So, of course, when we do the operation from the inside, we're looking to see if we can see a hole. But we are very strict. My, or at least I'm very strict about, I'm sure the vast majority of other surgeons are, if not all, about keeping people nil by mouth until the morning and then slowly having some water and seeing how patients go to make sure there's not a perforation. Uh, of course, with any operation like this, when we're putting a scope in the mouth, there's always a, smith, a risk of dental damage. And one of the very important points when we assess patients for this operation is to ensure they've got good neck extension and good mouth opening because it's a bit like swallowing a sword. If you can't get a view of the pouch, you can't do it endoscopically, you can't do it through the mouth. Um, so the, the main risk is perforation, and, and that's what we, we're most concerned about. Well, the, the, the patient's going to suffer the symptoms that we discussed, so uh, find it more and more difficult to swallow, um, can find that it's, it's not very nice to have bad breath or regurgitate. Um, and of course, if you're unable to swallow, you're not going to get adequate nutrition not getting adequate nutrition, you're not going to be the best person you can be at that age. Um, and that, the worst side of things, if you're regurgitating food from your pouch into your chest silently, particularly as one gets much older, sometimes the, the, the laryngeal reflex is impaired, so it doesn't allow you to cough it out so well. You know, cough can be another, another, another sequelae. Um, then you can get chest infections that can make you very unwell. So, you know, it's very important if you ha if you suspicious you've got a pouch or you know you've got a pouch that you consult an ENT head neck surgeon to see where, what the best path is. It's not an absolute that all pouches need to be treated, uh, but equally uh, when it's symptomatic, then it's something that, that is relatively simple to do and genuinely can make a world of difference to patients. I've seen plenty of patients that uh, you know, it's really made life-changing difference uh, treating their pouch, which is, you know, ultimately what we love doing to help people that are suffering.